Councilmember Ben Kalos, Chair of the Committee. Uh, you can tweet me at Ben Kalos. Uh, today we're here holding an oversight hearing on the 2016 Mayor's Management Report, or commonly referred to as the MMR. The MMR is a twice yearly report to the public and the Council on the Performance of Municipal Agencies. It is meant to be a tool for management and oversight so we the Council and we the public can evaluate the operations of our city government. We've held multiple hearings evaluating the structure and content of the MMR and PMR with most recent in April of this year and look and looking at this year's MMR, I'm happy to say that we have some victories from those hearings. In prior hearings, we asked for a definition of target to be clarified. And uh, we've also asked include uh, uh, various sections from the charter, including agency rulemaking. I want to thank the Mayor's Office of Operations for hearing the concerns of uh, myself, the committee, as well as the larger council and taking actions. These are only the latest in many improvements to the MMR this session, and it's my hope that after discussion today, we will keep that process of continual improvement moving forward. As part of that effort, the council has also sent a letter to the Mayor's Office of Operations yesterday, asking detailed questions about many indicators and making recommendations on possible improvements to agency sections of the MMR. While this hearing will focus on possible improvements, uh, on while this hearing will focus on the larger overall picture of the MMR, how it is structured and how it is produced, I want the public to know that the interest of uh, this committee and the council, the MMR, does not end with this hearing. We will continue oversight of every portion of it. Uh, in preparation for this hearing, we have turned, uh, give me one moment. Uh, I want to thank uh, again the Director of Operations, Mindy Tarlow, and Deputy Director of Performance Management, Tina Chu, for joining us today. Also. Uh, want to thank our uh, committee counsel, uh, Brad Reed, and uh, committee finance analyst, James Sabuti, uh, for doing a great uh, job preparing for today, as well as that as uh, we would with a full committee staff. And uh, I'll now pass it on to our committee counsel to uh, swear you under oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin with your testimony. Thank you. And good morning, Chair Kalos. Um, happy to be here this morning. Um, I'm Mindy Tarlow. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Operations, and I'm joined this morning by Tina Chu, Deputy Director for Performance Management. Thank you for this opportunity, as always, to discuss the Mayor's Management Report, or MMR, with you. As you know, for almost 40 years, the MMR has served as a public account of city agency performance, measuring whether they are delivering vital services efficiently, effectively, and expeditiously. As mandated by Section 12 of the New York City Charter, the Mayor reports to the public and the City Council twice a year on city agency performance. An annual MMR is released every September, and a preliminary MMR, or PMMR, covering the first four months of the fiscal year, is published approximately two weeks after the release of the city's January financial plan. The MMR and PMMR cover the operations of city agencies that report directly to the mayor. Three additional non-mayoral agencies are included for a total of 44 agencies and organizations. Activities that have direct impact on New Yorkers, including the provision of support services to other agencies, are the focus of the report. The report is organized by agency around a set of services listed at the beginning of each agency chapter. Within service areas, goal statements articulate the agency's aspirations. Each goal statement is accompanied by performance indicators that speak to whether or not the agency is achieving that goal and how much progress has been made. The services, goals, and indicators are developed through collaboration between the Office of Operations and the senior managers of each agency. The MMR and PMMR are available via an interactive website and as PDF documents. Also, throughout the year, agencies provide monthly updates on most of the critical indicators contained in the MMR and PMMR through the Citywide Performance Reporting, or CPR, portal. CPR is publicly available on the city's website and allows users to sort information by agency and by time period. 
CPR also provides opportunities to view five-year trends as well as mapping information for select indicators. MMR and PMMR data can also be publicly accessed online through the city's open data portal. The MMR has historically been, and continues to be, a collection of key metrics taken from individual city agencies so the public can evaluate the efficacy of city government in areas like education, safety, housing, health and human services, public infrastructure, and administrative services. More recently, in addition to reporting on performance indicators for individual agencies, the MMR has highlighted initiatives that cross multiple agencies and disciplines. We continue to emphasize multi-agency collaborations, including signature city initiatives like Pre-K for All, Vision Zero, and Housing New York, as well as new efforts that began in 2015, such as the Mayor's Task Force on Behavioral Health and the Criminal Justice System and Career Pathways. In the fiscal 2016 MMR, we introduced a chapter on Thrive NYC the city's action plan to change the way people think about mental health and service delivery by the city government and its many partners. The implementation of Thrive NYC is overseen by the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Operations and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Thrive NYC puts New York City at the forefront of the movement to develop a comprehensive solution to a pervasive problem. Also in fiscal 2016, we introduced two new expanded sections, one on spending and budget information by units of appropriation, and the second on agency rulemaking actions. The section on spending and budget information provides expenditures for city agencies by unit of appropriation as reported in the city's fiscal 2015 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR, as well as the budgeted amounts for fiscal 2016 as reported in the fiscal 2016 adopted budget. The section on agency rulemaking provides a summary of rulemaking actions taken by agencies during fiscal 2016, including the total number of actions taken, the number of actions that were not in the regulatory agenda prepared for the fiscal year, including a summary of the reasons the rules were not included, and the number of rulemaking actions that were adopted under the emergency rulemaking procedures. I note that there were no emergency actions taken in fiscal 2016. Since fiscal 2014, each agency MMR chapter has opened with a focus on equity statement. These statements highlight our belief that effective government performance must take into account the fair delivery and quality of services across the locations and populations of our city. This focus on equity continues to evolve as agencies advance their work and launch new programs and initiatives that create a New York that is fair and accessible to all residents. In the fiscal 2016 MMR, agencies continued to highlight equity. The MMR provides multiple data points and several options to evaluate performance, with three or four elements providing context for each MMR indicator. The MMR helps readers evaluate performance by comparing, one, the current year and the previous year, year-over-year -year change, two, the desired direction and the year-over-year -year change, three, the desired direction and the five-year trend, and finally, where available, four, the current year's actual to that year's numeric or directional target. Further, in the narrative portion of the MMR, on the first page of every agency section, the agency's goal statements clearly spell out what the agency is working to achieve. Each goal statement is repeated on the following pages with specific measurements so you can clearly see if the stated goal is being met. Generally, we evaluate performance by comparing the current year to the previous year, the same comparison that forms the basis of the continuous improvement model used in the citywide performance reporting system, or CPR. As you know, the Office of Operations refined and clarified the explanation of quote-unquote target that appears in the MMR user's guide as a result of discussions with this committee. Beginning with the 2016 PMMR, target was described as, quote, desired levels of performance for the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year. Targets can be numeric or directional. 
numeric targets can set an expected level of performance, a maximum level not to be exceeded, or a minimum level to be met. Directional targets are represented by up or down arrows. An asterisk means no numeric or directional target was set, unquote. This clarified explanation can be found in the user's guide on page 341 of the PDF version of the MMR at www.nyc.gov MMR. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the work of the Mayor's Office of Operations as we perform our effort to put together the MMR and PMMR. The reports are a product of ongoing collaboration between the Office of Operations and 44 city agencies and partners, and we're very proud of the work we do. Tina and I look forward to answering any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I'd uh, like to start by uh, uh, asking you, do you watch The Crown on Netflix? And I do remind you, you are under oath. Yes, sir, I'm proud to say that I have just completed episode six of The Crown as of last evening. Uh, are you familiar with uh, advice given by King George to uh, the, the soon-to-be Queen Elizabeth regarding how he reviewed reports? Yes, I am. Uh, Would you like me to explicate that? Yes, please. Um, he suggested that when she gets all her incoming correspondence that comes in a box every day, that rather than start at the top, she flip it over and start from the bottom, where most important things are kept. Uh, and so I think that is our intent today. So this, this being uh, the MMR, uh, and- I forgot my tiara, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, we, we hope to focus on the uh, appendix at this hearing, which would be uh, th this portion of the document, and so flipping over the report. Uh, so the- the MMR, uh, as I'm holding right here, is quite massive. How many copies are you printing each year? We print about 40 copies. And is that just the MMR or the uh, MMR plus the appendix? That would be the, the main body of the MMR. Okay. And uh, how many uh, downloads of the MMR do you get unique downloads you get from your website, would you say? Or unique visits of the MMR site, and that's actually right behind you on the screen. Right, so from uh, the and date that- And sorry, for those following along at home or online, uh, that's at nyc.gov slash MMR. Right. So for the period between September 19th and November 13th, so the, uh, with the issuance of the MMR on September 19th, uh, online activity was about 3,000 visits to the MMR landing page, which you see on the screen, and then uh, 966 visits to the FY16 MMR page, and about a little over 1,000 downloads of the report itself. Given that you're not actually printing that many and most of the use is of people downloading a 300-some-odd a page PDF, would it be possible to add the 80 or so pages of the appendix to the main body so that uh, people see it when they download it versus having to download it separately through, uh, I'll just show it for folks watching at home, uh, in order to find it, you have to scroll all the way down and then know that the things you're looking for are one of 11 additional tables. Would it be possible to include it in the main body of the PDF? Yes, I think that'd be fine. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I guess one, question that uh, many of us have is just as we're folk and I think the overall theme of the hearing is focusing on how the city is managed and uh, what tools are being used uh, and so if you can just share and I think you touched on a little bit in your testimony how various agencies use the MMR is this something that's purely a report mandated by the Charter for the Council is it for the public? Is it actually used by Mayor's Office of Operations? Is it used by agency heads? Uh, how is it being used for management of our city? So uh, going to the discussion about how agencies use the MMR, um, the indicators that are in the MMR uh, sometimes are reflective of actual things that the agencies want to report on and follow and track for themselves. 
So it's not necessarily an external type of reporting done in that regard, but things that they also want to monitor and, and follow up on for their own purposes. Um, obviously, there's the discussions that are had between agencies and operations in sort of tracking the information, agencies and the public, uh, agencies and this body uh, as well, uh, and also the press in terms of getting a transparent look at what uh, performance is looking like regarding the key services and goals for each agency. So I think the, the answer to your question is it's all of the above. And the ways in which agencies have discussions about these indicators, I think that that's a better question to ask them specifically. But in our interactions with them, we understand that they have been using, you know, as uh, Mindy Tarlow mentioned, this report has been out for about 40 years, and a lot of these indicators have been around for a long time. So this is really becoming part of the actual sort of day-to-day -day and operational ways of understanding the work of an agency. I noticed uh, some announcements uh, and, and good news in the document as well as the testimony. Uh, you, you've indicated you've added an additional schedule. Uh, was that uh, in response to uh, questions from the Committee on Governmental Operations uh, during the previous hearings? Uh, are you refer you're referring to the, the spending and budget information? As well as rulemaking. The, rule the rulemaking, yes. So um, I th believe at the last hearing that we had, there was you know a discussion about expanding the information that was currently provide that had been provided previously, so we took under advisement and looked into the possibilities for adding more information and made the changes that we thought were feasible and uh, that were being asked for. And uh, so we now have a new schedule on agency rulemaking actions, uh, and uh, it was noted that there were no emergency actions. Uh, however, in reading the uh, agency rulemaking for fiscal 2016. It noted that uh, 65 out of the 91 rules were not in a regulatory agenda, which is about 70 percent. Uh, so I guess the first question is, in trying to read this, and if we can just share for the general public, what is the regulatory agenda? So under CAPA, the City Administrative Procedure Act, agencies are required to publish an annual regu regulatory agenda indicating what rules they plan to issue over the course of the year. Um, I think they're published around May of each year. Uh, and as I'm sure you can understand, um, you can't always anticipate what's going to happen. Um, and so often uh, agencies add rules throughout the year in response to things that occur during the year. Um, as they do that, I emphasize that they still follow the same procedures um, that all rules follow um, in terms of the public hearing, the, uh, the work of our office, and the law department in terms of certifying, et cetera. Uh, so currently the agency rulemaking for fiscal, so, so you're assuring me that all 91 of the rules here, uh, there was a, a public notice and uh, there was an opportunity for public comment and uh, that regular timelines were uh, followed and just in 65 cases it didn't happen to be in a regulatory agenda that's published once a year to give people a broader notice of the plans of an agency. Is that yes. correct? Great. Uh, the current uh, rulemaking schedule appears to be the bare minimum required by the charter uh, just in order for folks who are looking at it who may not have the same expertise, would it be possible to add additional information explaining that uh, they still follow the regular uh, rulemaking rule process? We can add an explanatory note to that. Thank you. Uh, moving on to, to the other uh, piece of uh, good news, uh, can you explain how the schedule on units of appropriations has changed in response to questioning from this committee? Uh, and what new features are there? So that particular table uh, in previous reports listed out the units of appropriation by agency. And in the most recent P uh, MMR, we added information from the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report um, to show the uh, spending for fiscal 15 and also showed the adopted budget for fiscal 16. So the dollar values are included now in that particular schedule. 
And so the charter uh, chapter 12, uh, sorry, section 12 C6 says, quote, an appendix indicating the relationship between the program performance goals included in the management report pursuant to paragraph two of the subdivision and the corresponding expenditures made pursuant to the adopted budget for the previous fiscal year. And I note that we have taken a step in the right direction. Do you feel that the current schedule uh, ties performance to budget, performance goals to budget? Given that we're working with the units of appropriation, yes, we think that's the best path forward for providing this information. And we're continuing to cooperate with OMB on available um, options for this work. So one of the uh, challenges is that in trying to, I, I have experience in the private sector and uh, I think to the extent government can start to approach that and rather than taking the budget for granted, especially as we may be seeing an economic slowdown where, where we may go from surplus to deficit, uh, it's good to have money, but uh, ultimately we're accountable to our shareholders, in this case the general public, and uh, having been in companies when we tried to raise money, when we tried to take money from others, they would often ask us, how much money do you need for what goal and what is our return on investment? Uh, I'm a, a huge fan of Thrive NYC, however, uh, and my mother is a psychologist, big supporter of mental health, grew up with it, uh, but we have a goal of having Department of Health and Me uh, Mental Hygiene train 24,560 people on, uh, on, on mental health, and uh, I don't see a unit of appropriation to fund that training. So. I can't turn to my mother, a uh, psychologist, or another expert to see whether or not we're getting our return on investment. Uh, uh, is there a portion, do you, is there somewhere in that schedule that you believe that that is represented? And is it possible that we could begin to start seeing those representations? Um, as you know, over the years we have, um, uh, made great strides in capturing multi-agency initiatives, some of which involve 15 or more agencies. Um, so we're proud of that work. Um, uh, if because they're multi-agency, it, it does make it more complex. Um, and we are uh, uh, always looking to improve our services um, and uh, continue to collaborate um, with our partners at OMB. Um, as we go forward with this work. I, I've had similar situations with uh, OMB and other agencies. Uh, would uh, the Mayor's Office Operations be open to sitting down with the Council on OMB to discuss this further and figuring out how we can make sure that not only are units of appropriation available, and we've actually already worked with OMB to get the budget online, but making sure that there's enough specificity so that when you have a multi-agency uh, project, we're able to actually see how much that's costing just for the project or what it is broken out across the different agencies so we can just have an idea of what we're spending on what and what our return is. We're certainly happy to cooperate in efforts that you're uh, engaged in with OMB. Th thank you. I, I think performance budgeting is a very useful tool and uh, the more we can uh, have more transparency around what we're doing, uh, the better. So moving on to a, the, the next schedule, if you'll give me one moment. We're covering a uh, lot of ground here today. Uh, the, and again, thank you for adding both, for adding additional schedule and improvements to units of appropriation. Uh, with regards to internal controls, uh, the Charter requires a statement of the status of an agency's internal control environment and systems, including a summary of any actions taken during previous fiscal year, any actions being taken during the current fiscal year to strengthen an agency's uh, internal controls. And uh, at the uh, same time as that is required, uh, it seems that this is an area where some big news events of the past year regarding agency processes would appear 
yet the DCAS section makes no mention of deed restriction removal process. ACS makes no mention of responses to tune audit by a controller stringer and similar absences from HPD and DHS sections. Do these agencies take actions to strengthen their control environments and systems or were those actions just not included from this report for some reason and what is the criteria for inclusion? So um, these statements are compiled annually by our office and they cover reviews of mayoral agencies, one uh, internal control certifications, two financial integrity statements, three applicable state and city controllers audit reports, and four agency responses to such reports. Um, the heads of the agencies attested to the status of their agency's internal control systems, including with respect to the 16 areas covered by the city controllers directive one checklist of the financial integrity statement. But there is a lag in the reports that operations relies on for developing these internal control statements. Uh, the most recent MMR statements cover the fiscal 2015 period and were due March 31st, 2016 based on uh, City Controller Directive 1. Uh, a similar Directive 1 submission with, with respect to calendar 2016 will be requested at the close of this calendar year. And um, agency head MMR certifications with respect to fiscal 2015 period were due on April 18th, 2016. Um, and updates are requested accordingly. So you can just wanted to lay out that particular timeline in terms of the types of reports that we rely on to build the statements. So you can see a little bit of that lag has been introduced. So the timing might be a little bit different in terms of your expectations for what, um, what information might be shown in the FY16 MMR. Would it be possible to move from first quarter 2016 to second quarter, move, move the deadline uh, from first quarter to second quarter because this document is coming out uh, in the third quarter and so since a lot of what we're referring to happened in second quarter it might provide for a more current document versus having that one quarter two quarter lag. Uh, my understanding is that timeline and that deadline is the city controllers. Okay so we will uh, w reach out to the controller about uh, that deadline and to the extent that uh, the language around uh, the schedule on internal control reporting can be updated to say that it's uh, prior fiscal year plus first quarter of, sorry, the three quarters <laughs> into, uh, if, if you can just include the date certain for when the information will be updated, would that be amenable? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we, are, we are covering a lot of ground. Uh, the uh, next piece is a uh, section on customer observing and reporting experiences. The MMR notes that the methodology for calculating uh, customer observing and reporting experience core ratings changed this fiscal year. Can you explain how this m is measured, what facilities are being measured, and who collects that data and change in methodology? Uh, and I think the reason that I'm asking this question is just uh, there were a lot of places that seemed counterintuitive for having very high scores. So Department of Homeless Services had scores of 100% for facility cleaning and maintenance facility operations. Uh, HRA also had similar, NYCHA had scores in the 90s, uh, and these are places that are well known to not have the, the best facilities, so it seems counterintuitive, so if you can help us understand what facilities and as previously asked. Sure. Um, so the, the core program, again, customers observing and reporting experience, uh, looks at facility conditions and customer service only at walk-in service centers open to the public. So for example, in the case of a DHS shelter, um, the observations would be taken only at the intake center and not at the actual shelters themselves. Uh, the people who are conducting the observations and doing the evaluations are the Street Condition Observation Unit, or SCOUT, which has inspectors that arrive unannounced at service centers conduct observations and rate 11 physical conditions and four customer service elements. 
So they look at facility operations, including whether security guards are professional, accessible, and knowledgeable, whether the queuing process is timely and efficient, whether frontline staff personnel are professional, accessible, and knowledgeable, and whether the facility is accessible for uh, limited English proficient customers in terms of having notices of interpretation, translated signs, and translated documents. In terms of cleaning and maintenance, the inspectors look at facility signage, lighting, floor and carpeting, walls, windows, ceilings, restrooms, seating, uh, presence of graffiti, uh, presence of litter and trash. And they determine an overall average score based on the rating of the above 15 conditions. So again, the physical conditions and customer service conditions for walk-in facilities. So the conditions are rated as excellent, good, fair, or poor. I wanted to note, in, given your question about some of the facilities that have been rated highly, um, due to recent renovations at the Adult Family Intake Center and the 30th Street Men's Shelter, as well as the new PATH building in the Bronx, uh, DHS has scored very high in recent years for those particular facilities. In terms of the changed methodology, in fiscal 16, the overall rating, um, instead of going to all of the walk-in service centers that we had been inspecting in prior years, for agencies with multiple service centers, inspectors focused instead on sites that has had historically lower scores, specifically sites that received an aver average overall site score of 85 or lower over the last three years, and sites that received a score of 85 or lower in fiscal 2015. If all agency service centers scored above 85 last year, the service center with the lowest overall score was inspected. So for example, DHS has three centers, two of which received 100 points. That's the Adult Family Intake Center and 30th Street Men's Shelter, as I mentioned previously, and one of which received 86 points, which was PATH in the Bronx. Because all of them were above 85 points, the lowest score was selected. Um, the site with the lowest score was selected for inspection in FY16, and therefore only PATH was evaluated for the 2016 MMR. Uh, this year, seven agencies received an overall facility rating of 100. Under the old methodology, that only occurred three times in the past four fiscal years. If you count all the hundreds given for facility cleaning and maintenance and facility operations, then you'll see there were 24 of them this year, compared to only 13 the past four fiscal years combined. Uh, what's the cause of the sudden increase in ratings of 100? Well, I think that if looking at the prior year, so comparing fiscal 2015 to 2016, the fact that the percentage of perfect scores, the percentage of perfect scores actually went down from 21% to 15%. So uh, in fiscal 2016, we visited 64 sites and nine of those sites had perfect scores. So that was 15% overall that had perfect scores uh, compared to 21% in the prior year. That's partly because of the change in the number of sites that we visited. And So I guess the, a follow-up question is just, with all the hundreds, is, this, is the metric still informative? And uh, not, not to be the teacher that everyone hates, but if, every, if everything's perfect, how do, how do we improve on perfect? Well, this is something that we can discuss in terms of you know, other options for looking at maybe the rating score um, and looking at those criteria, um, possibly looking at the other criteria that the sites are evaluated against. These are things that we would have to look into further to make sure that we have sort of a consistent methodology and that the expectations are also clear with the, with the agencies in terms of um, the sites that we'll be visiting and inspecting. And I, I guess, uh, would it be possible to share some of the underlying data that's used for CORE, not necessarily in a schedule, but in an open data set or something so that folks can see 
which facilities are getting which ratings and, and the underlying data so we have a better picture of what's being assessed. Well, we'll definitely look into that. And, and again, I would just say that the nicest facility that I've seen is at 100 Church Street in the new Oath building, and they still only got 98% uh, overall rating. Uh, and there's no lines. It's, it's professional, it's beautiful, it's newly renovated, uh, nicest courtrooms I've ever been in as an attorney. And yet, on the same side, I've been to the men's intake shelter in New York, in, in Manhattan, and uh, the security didn't feel the same, of, of the same professionalism. The, the materials that I was handed, the, even the containers to put our stuff in, weren't even up, up taken up. Uh, the building wasn't renovated. There were long lines. It, you're in a converted building. It, it's the difference between Class A office space and uh, manufacturing or other uses that have been converted into a, an office use, as it were. So it's just hard to see a 100 for DHS and a 98 for Oath. And it seems like in, in most cases, we'd look to see improvement. I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member uh, Mark Levine and uh, Reynoso. Uh, if you can just give me one moment, we are covering a lot of ground much quicker than I expected. Hold on. The next schedule we'll be reviewing is the uh, procurement schedule. Uh, emergency, pro emergency procurement has actually gone down under the administration from $690.6 million in fiscal year 2013 to a pretty consistent $123.7 to $148.8 million in fiscal years 2014 through 16. The charter in section 315 defines emergency procurement as in the case of an unforeseen danger to life, safety, property, or a necessary service, why did we still have 127 emergencies, quote unquote, in 2016 to the tune of $148.8 million? And is this something that Mayor's of Office of Operations focuses on? Um, I think that um, we are required to produce this uh, report, but as you know, the Mayor's Office of Contract Services also provides a very detailed report on procurement. Um, we can cer we certainly collaborate with them, but um, believe that the question around emergency procurement is probably best addressed by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. And is uh, Mayor's Office of Contract Services where are they in relation to Mayor's Office of Operations? Are they a lateral or Pierce. do they? They're Pierce. Uh, I, I guess one of the larger questions, which I think is part of it, is in terms of operations and working with other, with peers, what opportunity do you have to work with them around the procurement schedule since it ends up in the MMR and being able to? push back and let mocks know, hey, these these numbers aren't going to really look the best or trying to push back or whose who's responsibility would it be to push back on uh, reducing the amount of emergency procurement? The Mayor's Office of Contract Services um, uh, is an agency we work very closely with. Um, we've done a lot of work together about uh, helping the city be more efficient. Um, and we have a very collaborative relationship um, and are happy to discuss this with them. Okay, and, and uh, I'm just gonna ask a couple of other questions to the extent you have answers. If not, we will work with 
uh, and the council, and we will follow up directly with Mayor's Office of Contract Services. Under agency procurement actions by method, uh, there's some, uh, something called a, quote, demonstration, demonstration project, and they seem to have increased from one for $85,000 under Bloomberg to eight for $14.7 million in 2016. I am familiar with uh, um, the procurement actions um, in general, but I, I do think that your questions are better directed towards the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. That's their area of expertise, and um, I wouldn't want to speak on their behalf on these matters. Okay. I have one other piece I'll, I'll ask just for you to pass on, uh, and we'll follow up directly, which is under the, the same item. There's a renewal, and I've noticed that that's increased from accounts of 560 and 2.2 billion in FY13 to accounts of 883 and 3 billion in FY16. Uh, it, it also dipped. Uh, so I was curious about that increase, and also I noticed a sizable dip from the two to three billion dollars to actually 907 million in. FY 2015, so I assume you need to just pass that on as well. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm familiar with procurement um, and work closely with Mox and its leadership, but I do think that those questions are best directed at that leadership. Uh, last piece, which I know is for you. Uh, on the chart on page 58 under agency procurements by method, the appendix needs to be fixed to widen it slightly because the text for methods and the column is cut off, uh, and can this be updated? Uh, it looks okay to what I'm looking at, but um, I take your point, and we will look at it and certainly want to make sure that we always have the right uh, uh, page structure so people can view our reports. And uh, we've been joined by Council Member Joe Borelli, who has perfect attendance at this committee and was uh, the only person not surprised earlier this month. I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, f fair, fair enough. Uh, There is a schedule for citywide statement of needs. Uh, the MMR includes this appendix on implementation of these statements of needs. Uh, I was curious about uh, which projects, how projects are selected for being included on the citywide statement of needs. I noticed uh, projects in my district weren't there. I also noticed that certain things like DCAS training centers weren't there. And DCAS is expanding its training centers into all five boroughs. My understanding is that the citywide statement of needs are put together by each community board, um, and they have a prioritization process for gathering those needs and then providing them in a report. Um, so uh, the schedule that we have is just a record of what's being implemented that is generated from those reports. We don't generate those reports. We're just responding to uh, what we've received, and they're put together by community boards. Uh, last schedule before we get to the main body of the mayor's management report, uh, there's an interpretation schedule. According to this schedule, the city receives over a million requests for interpretation every year. Just looking at the top three agencies alone, there were 732,605 such requests to HRA. 425,157 to 311, and 258,018 to NYPD. Uh, do we track the languages being requested? Do we track whether interpre interpretation was actually provided and how long it took? Do we track how often that interpre interpretation is in person by city staff and how often it relies on a contract with a vendor by phone? Is this information that we could track? I mean, this is something that we're uh, definitely willing to look into more. I think we have some reports that cur may currently capture some portion of this information and can look into this further. On to the uh, mayor's management uh, report. Uh, I want to thank you for providing within the MMR a clearer definition of the uh, term target in response to discussions we've had on the issue at a prior hearing. I think it's an exam excellent example of progress we made to continue to make improvements to the MMR. Uh, is it possible that we could indicate the type of target, such as if it is an expected level of performance, 
a maximum level not to exceed, a minimum level to be met. Uh, yeah, we're looking into ways that we could provide this information, possibly um, given the limitations of the printed version, to see whether we could either provide this within an open data file as a way for uh, that information to be linked to the indicator, um, or possibly as a separate file that, that could be used in conjunction with the data. My, for, for what it's worth, whether it's a, a, a symbol or just adding a, a single column or even a superscript, uh, max, min, and even a bullseye <laughs> uh, icon. Uh, just, I think it would take minimal uh, space to add it there. Uh, can you, uh, and, and also I believe, give me one moment, it may be worth adding as a definition based on our conversations, uh, national standard. I do not see that in the current definition, and I believe that is a, one of the standards that you use. Uh, as an explanation for why a target is set the way it is, it wouldn't, I think the other three Right, so if it's a national standard, it falls within it, but to the extent something is a national standard, if there's some way of trying to uh, communicate that to the users. Uh, can you provide any examples of where the city has set an indicator target to a number better than a national standard? or do we typically just use national standards? I think if it's the national standard is used because it's, an easy, it's something that can be benchmarked and that has uh, sort of a rationale behind it, so I will look into it further. I don't know offhand uh, whether there has been uh, a target that's set more higher or differently from uh, an existing national standard. So in terms of how we set targets, which I know is a place where we uh, have disagreed, uh, one question is what role the MMR can play in this. So as we deal with uh, situations at ACS and caseloads and currently have uh, caseloads at, at one number above 10 and the caseloads appear to be going up even though there's a desired direction of down and there's a uh, national standard sorry, there's a, another number that is set higher. Could we change that in order to see lower case loads uh, at uh, DHS? Could we use uh, the targets to uh, lower the homeless, the number of unsheltered homeless? Uh, what role do the targets play and what impact can they have on agency performance so that we have uh, better management in our city and better desired outcomes such as our children being safer, fewer folks on the streets. What What is that whole role and uh, what can we do in terms of uh, changing those targets and what would that impact be? Right, um, as, as we've discussed before and in general, the targets are set through an iterative process among operations, the agency, and obviously multiple stakeholders. Um, the targets are stated, they're explicit, they're in the report, and the indicator's desired direction and trend over time is also shown in relation to that target. So by making the information openly available, you know, various stakeholders can evaluate performance and engage in a discussion about whether priorities, resources, and attention need to be adjusted for indicators of interest or concern. So the, um, whether the target makes the change happen or whether a change happens and a target gets reflected are sort of two sides of the same coin. And I think having these types of ongoing conversations about indicators of interest and outcomes of interest can help with the target as context to see whether or not, again, either attention, resources, or priorities need to be shifted to be able to make um, the actual underlying performance and operations change. So, you know, a target as a number isn't like a thermostat. I can't change the thermostat. In this situation, I can't change the number and have operations and performance change magically because of that, but it triggers the conversation around what direction we want things to be moving towards. 
and whether um, the desired or required resources are necessary and available to make that change occur. I'd like to note we've been joined by uh, Councilmember David Greenfield. So I guess if, if there's a member who's concerned about ACS or DHS, uh, and we've already sent a letter with uh, recommendations and uh, responses to the MMR. Uh, what is the best way to, to improve performance? Is it doing the hearings and dealing directly with the agency in question, or is it a combination of working with that agency and the mayor's office to change uh, uh, the, the standards as well as indicators and measures? I think the, the process that's set forward with having discussions with the agencies is, is obviously a great way for you to make your priorities clear and sort of the ongoing process of discussion with the agency in thinking through what they have to do next is something that we've also um, sort of keep tabs on and you know hear about and follow uh, discussions in these settings as well. So the I think we've got an overall way to understand sort of what the issues and concerns are and developing the different methods for follow through. Thank you very much. I was concerned that this was going to be the fastest hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I'd uh, like to uh, pass it over to Councilmember David Greenfield who has arrived with questions. Thank you Mr. Chairman and uh, just so you know we have another hearing going on across street at the same time. I'm not sure that's because we have a lot of hearings or that's because uh, Chair Kalos likes to schedule a lot of hearings. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Will, will I see you at Thursday's hearing? There, oh, yes, of course, Thursday's hearing. I'm looking forward to whatever yeah, and the And we also have another hearing for a vote this month. Okay, excellent. Um, with that being said, uh, I do have a couple of quick questions. So regarding the MMR, I, I believe uh, it was discussed that there aren't that many folks who look at this information or access that information, right? Is that something that we discussed earlier today in terms of uh, folks that are actually viewing this info? Uh, provided some information on the number of web views and downloads, and can repeat that if you'd be interested. Yeah, no, I think it was pretty limited. Yeah, I just heard, I got the information from my staff, right? I think that was a pretty limited number. W what do you think we can do to grow that number? I mean, you have eight and a half million people in this uh, city. Is there a way uh, for example, to have the information be more current? Is there a way, for example, to get the information out there as opposed to sort of on the, uh, I, I would say even perhaps on a weekly basis, monthly basis, a daily basis, real time? How do we get more New Yorkers involved with the information that's out there? So the, we do have information provided on a monthly basis online at our citywide performance reporting site. So that information does get updated for the critical indicators for the public to see. Um, whether or not we could do more real-time, daily, weekly types of updates, many of these indicators work on a different kind of cycle in terms of their collection and also making sure that the data is sort of uh, gathered properly uh, introduces a lag time uh, in some instances. So monthly report, but monthly reporting is definitely available. Got it. I guess my question, I guess my question is, right, the, the MMR is a wealth of uh, information and certainly appreciated by uh, us policy wonks and nerds in government. But once again, I think part of the challenge is, even though it's good and we're appreciative, is that it's, uh, it's somewhat outdated by the time the information comes because the reality of the city is that it's always changing. W what would prevent us from having let's call it daily or weekly or even real-time updates on what's happening in the city. And wouldn't you agree that potentially that would be more effective, right? You know, sort of, let's call it, uh, for lack of a better term, let's call it the ComStat of uh, city services across the board, right? So ComStat is pretty much real-time. It may not be shared in real-time with, uh, with everyone, but certainly it's given to the public on a weekly basis where you can sort of see in every precinct what, uh, which crimes have gone up, which crimes have gone down, and that's important because it allows you to sort of go in there and fix issues, and it's helpful for the commissioner because the commissioner is able to know, well, this is where I'm having trouble in this precinct or that precinct. I would imagine this could be helpful for commissioners across the board as well if they had real-time data as opposed to, let's be honest, if you're looking at something several months back, you don't really have the same uh, impetus or uh, ability for 
uh, change. And, and once again, it's not a criticism because in general, uh, I think the MMR shows many positive things. It's just a curiosity as to why is it that we can't do that in, let's call it a real-time fashion. What would it take, perhaps, to get that done? Are there some agencies that can have it done? If so, are we doing that for those agencies? Come and get that information and so on and so forth. I think you see where I'm going over here. So uh, again, as as Tina pointed out, the citywide performance reporting system, which is online and which is the feeder for the MMR, is actually updated much more frequently than the MMR. Um, I, the majority of indicators, I believe, are tracked on a monthly basis, so that gets you a lot closer to real time than twice a year. And then, of course, there are numerous indicators like graduation rates and things like that um, that, of course, have a much longer sure. uh, lag time. But uh, uh, we certainly think um, CPR is a very good tool, um, something uh, that we could um, be more engaging with the public about. There's also, of course, open data, um, things like 311 that are changing, um, I think, daily on open data. Um, and uh, so we're always looking for ways to improve our ability to report data. But those two methods right that we have right now, um, I think, are certainly uh, faster uh, and more accessible than the, you know, twice a year MMR. So let me ask you this. I mean, the citywide reporting system, uh, according to our staff, has actually crashed on a few occasions and isn't, uh, quite frankly, that user friendly. And uh, I think, uh, uh, obviously, when we talk about the numbers of folks who are actually downloading the MMR and unique visitors, it's a virtually statistically insignificant portion of New Yorkers, right? I mean, it actually doesn't matter. It would be the equivalent of, of no offense, but it would be the equivalent of zero, right? If it's that small amount of people in the grand scheme of eight and a half million people, you know, it really honestly doesn't matter. Is there, is there, are there any plans in the future to make it more user friendly? Uh, a, to make sure the system doesn't crash, and B, to make it easily accessible for people so that they can go onto a website and just sort of, you know, put in some information. Let's call it uh, uh, a Google model, right? You know, you, you type in, uh, you type in uh, red light, Ocean Parkway, and then sort of everything populates uh, as opposed to sort of the current uh, hunting model where you sort of have to find what you want, which makes it a lot less user friendly. Um, yes, where we would um, love to make our systems as user friendly as possible and get all New Yorkers engaged in, uh, in performance management and performance indicators. I'm sure you can appreciate the task that that would be, but um, yes, we always uh, uh, have expressed an interest in improving our ability to inform the public. Okay, are there any, no, and I, I know that, and conceptually, I, 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 I trust you, Mindy, that in fact that is the goal. I'm asking on an actual practical level, what steps, if any, are being taken or could be taken, in fact, to get us to that point? I, I want to be clear, once again, I know this seems excessive from a government perspective. Let me just give you the greenfield view on how this should work. In my, in my mind, I believe you should be able to log on to a website and you should be able to track in real time everything, right, from the garbage collection to the potholes getting filled to the lights that are being repaired, and that there should be complete transparency and openness. And if we have that information, we should uh, certainly push it to the public. It would make it a lot easier for a citizens to know how their government is doing, and B, also for those of us who work in government, both elected officials and commissioners, to keep accountability for what's happening, because we can see in real time, okay, so last week we had trouble with garbage collection in this particular neighborhood, right? You know, we'll get those complaints uh, on occasion, but they're not aggregated, and so then I have to figure out, for example, in my office, seven people called me today within this sector, they have trouble with their garbage, I have to now call the sanitation depot, and I have to figure it out. I don't know if it's part of a larger trend, a one-day issue, or something that's happening across the city, for example. I'm not picking on the sanitation department because in general they're fabulous. I'm just saying that this happens on occasion. Or, you know, perhaps we'll know that when it rains outside, this is an issue and the reason is because there's more traffic and that's why uh, the sanitation department may not be able to hit uh, what they're supposed to hit. It just, to me, it just seems like we have this, the, the wealth of information. We're almost there. It's just, it's not real time and it's not user friendly. And if we could do both of those things, we'd, we'd really improve the uh, the government experience for New Yorkers, and then I think you have a lot more New Yorkers who would engage, as opposed to looking at something that's a really interesting document, but is not really relevant once it gets published and once I'm looking at it a few months later in terms of the information that's out there. 
So specifically, I guess, what could we do to make? Do you agree with that goal? Shall we say the goal? Does that does that make sense to you? Something something you actually would agree with? And if so, how do we get to that goal? Yes, I would agree completely that the the better our data is, the more accessible it is, the more transparent it is, and the more frequent it is. To the extent, as Tina said, that you know you make sure that you're you know reporting uh, clean vetted uh, data. Um, we agree. Um, we uh, uh, are not engaged in, you know, uh, discussions to radically shift the systems right now. Obviously, that would be taken into consideration along with a whole host of other uh, budget needs that I'm sure you're all very engaged in. Um, but I don't disagree at all that our goal should be to have a system that is as transparent and user-friendly and accurate and interesting as possible. All right, I'll take it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, folks. And Councilmember Greenfield, I share your goal. In fact, I want to one step further. I want to get an alert from my phone in my pocket anytime some city service changes in a way that has a material effect on my life, and otherwise, I don't care. Uh, so uh, I invite you to join as a co prime on legislation to that point. Uh, I do want to take a moment to note that. Uh, uh, for one of the items that was referenced, there is uh, nyc.gov slash CPR, which is actually up on the site. And uh, if uh, you want, we, we have a laptop, and we also have the interactive version of the MMR here if you feel like you wish to spend a moment or two showing it to folks. But otherwise, it can be accessed from the piece, and it's just a, it sh could perhaps be a little bit more prominent, but you have a choice between downloading the... Uh, 300 plus page report or uh, you can click on the interactive website which I think uh, provides an initial piece uh, to work on some of the improvements here. Mm -hmm. I can Or the can CPR um, icon on the side there. Yeah. There. Or there one, you up. Go. one up. Right. So if we click this it will bring up that page. I Correct. Think. And you can select an agency, you can select a time frame. Um, also, when you get into uh, the report itself, um, you can, uh, some of them are mapped. There'll be little globes, and that will open up into a map, things like crime statistics, school attendance statistics, sanitation, cleanliness statistics. You can also hover. Yeah, you see that globe there? Ah. Go to the globe. That's going to show you a map by community board. There we go. And you can hover, I think, to uh, see the different. David, where's your district? There we go. Exactly. Um, also, I, uh, which, which one is that? So that gives you the statistics right there, yeah. Gives you your cleanliness rating, and it gives you the percent change from the previous fiscal year to date. And, and that is continuously updated. And, as and ultimately, the more data, the better. So if we could drill down farther right. and farther, because at the yeah. end of the day, we care about our block, our right. backyard. And if you come out of that and go back to where you were before, and scroll down for me a bit, if you hover over the, um, I think it's at the number We can indicators. also give you the uh, computer if you want. No, no, please. <laughs> um, no, I think if you go to a specific agency like you did before. So we, yeah, I think we're on sanitation. And if you hover over the last full fiscal year, just go to come over to the left, uh, all the way to the first number, 95%. Yep. Um, you can click on that and see the five-year trend. Am I correct about that? Yes. It's so the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not exactly the same. Um, but again, you can do that for virtually any indicator. So some of them are mapped. Um, all of them have the five-year trend. Uh, and I would say the majority of them are updated monthly. I would just add, Mr. Chairman, this is a, a perfect example of how, right, for me, as somebody who started the NYC cleanup initiative in New York City where we're now putting seven and a half million dollars in where we have a great program where we get folks who have been 
formerly un unemployed or in some cases in homeless or in some cases incarcerated, and they're now cleaning up the streets of New York City, that, that w the information that we have here is nice, but the obvious information is lacking, right? So if I knew in my district that the following blocks in the last week or two have gotten dirtier, so I would then uh, deploy those services to those particular blocks, and then I'd have those blocks get cleaned up. Or if I knew there was dumping, for example, on those blocks, I would then call the sanitation department and ask them, well, let's work on some anti dumping measures, right? So this is a good example of, you know, a good start, which we appreciate, but the data isn't really helpful, like I said, sort of beyond policy, wonky-ish, interesting kind of thing. Oh, that's interesting, so we're doing 3.2% better than last year in Community Board 14, which is an area of 3.1 miles and has 250,000 people, right? Which is nice to know, but doesn't really help me sort of granularly solve the problem by saying, okay, on Avenue J and East 15th Street, dumping has increased 22% over the last year. I'm making that up because I don't know what the number is, right? And so what I need is I need sanitation department to come down, do a dumping sting, and I know that from East 15th to East 17th, there's an increase in garbage in the last two weeks, so I need to redeploy my resources and bring them down there as well. So my only point is that, you know, this information is interesting, but in my opinion, not super useful, let's say on a scale of one to 10 in terms of usefulness, I would say it was a three, uh, which is nice and good to know, and you know, great, uh, sort of a hypothetical, but I can't really improve my district-wide cleanliness, even if it went down by one or two points. But if I knew specifically where the trouble spots were in real time, you could get the usefulness up to a 10. So I know it seems like it's daunting from sort of where we're at here until where we can get over there to get this in real time, but I really think that the effort's worthwhile because the information is going to be infinitely more useful than it is right now. And that's what I meant before when I said it's sort of policy wonky. It's just interesting and we can have conversations about it. And, you know, it's nice to know. But if it's not really granular, I can't really, uh, you know, sort of take advantage in the, way, uh, in the way that I should and try to make those improvements. And that's why I'm asking to sort of try to get to a place where we can literally get it block by block, real time, know what the issues are, and then we can actually improve the services and then we can get to Ben Kalos's dream where you know if my sanitation truck is running late today I mean and that certainly to me would be the next level you get an alert and saying hey you know don't wait to bring your garbage cans back in because you're gonna miss your train this morning just go and you know roll the dice kind of thing and that obviously would be even more helpful and I understand more complicated but certainly to the extent we can get detailed real-time information block by block that would be amazingly helpful for us Understood. And, um, you know, I think you're talking about several things. Initially, we were talking about time horizons, and now you're also talking about what I would refer to as the unit of analysis, right, the block versus the district, et cetera. So uh, uh, I think that individual agencies, um, I think, have worked really hard on that kind of real-time data, whether it's, you know, something – you know, super familiar like CompStat, but also things that individual departments are doing. And also there's the 311 data, uh, which is um, quite robust, as I'm sure you know, uh, and very real time and very uh, uh, often very pinpoint geocoded. So that is also something. And that's, that's available available. publicly uh, in real time as well, so the public can see that data? It's available on open data uh, daily. Okay, but it's not in a user-friendly format, meaning the information is sort of just spit out there. there there's no, there's no user-friendly format where an average citizen can sort of come in and sort of see uh, the metrics, right? I mean, that's my understanding. Well, I think it, it's the data is released in that way so that people can look, figure out what they want to choose to look at. Um, there are like in the open. I mean, that's for the data experts like Chair Kalos, who can probably whip up a, a little uh, computer program that can sort of do it for him. But my point is the average New Yorker doesn't really, can't really make sense of that and figure it out and find it in a user-friendly way. That's my point. So I think we should be, we should be working towards uh, that goal. I apologize, but I'm now informed that I have to go back across the street to vote. So you are officially off the hook, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Greenfield, for uh, having Good questions. Uh, I just want to uh, note that according to the internet, uh, viewers at home uh, and uh, streaming live as well as people who will watch it later couldn't actually see the screen. And uh, to the extent that even elected officials weren't aware of how to use the CPR website or even the MMR Interactive uh, would 
Uh, Mayor's Office of Operations offer a training in coordination with the Mayor, uh, with the City Council Committee on Governmental Operations, the Council on how to use these tools so that uh, members and their staffs are aware of the resources? Of course, we'd be happy to. And I noticed that on the website there is a PDF tutorial uh, that can be found if you uh, click on the side under help. Uh, however, we, we now live in a world where why should we have to read it when we can watch it? Is there a possibility of uh, putting together a video tutorial on how to use it, how to click, and uh, how to navigate the CPR as well as the MMR? Yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at making a screencast. And, and ultimately, just to, to clarify, so uh, what is the Mayor's Office of Operations role in, in real-time reporting versus uh, Mayor's Management Report? So uh, CPR comes out monthly, uh, but we have, for, for instance, we do have a tool, as Greenfield was describing, uh, called Homestat, uh, where we are doing daily uh, reporting on homeless outreach, where it's happening. It's, it's would pull it up, but the public won't even see it. Uh, how can we expand that when, when it starts snowing, if, if, if but for global warming? Uh, we would have been watching today's storm on, on Plow NYC. So whose responsibility to, is that? Is that mayors of operations or others to create new tools to allow people to see transparently how the government is delivering services? Um, I think it varies. Uh, uh, the Homestat tool happens to be uh, run out of our office. Um, headed by Tina. Great. Um, uh, you mentioned Plow NYC. Obviously, that's something that the Department of Sanitation um, is responsible for. And as we know, CompStat is something that the PD is responsible for. I think, you know, the city is learning almost from each other. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we certainly play a role in how we aggregate and synthesize and then push out data, that's part of our job in terms of the multi-agency sort of work that we do. Um, uh, so I think it's a kind of a collective effort um, that's individual to individual agencies uh, uh, over time. And uh, just because uh, Councilmember Greenfield and I tend to disagree a lot often on many different issues, uh, I find the MMR to be incredibly useful. I do agree that more people should find it accessible. Uh, the numbers you gave were for a, a two-month period. Do you have the numbers for the previous year? I can look into those. I think to the extent we can share that because uh, that is probably more traffic than an average council member gets to their website uh, on the council.nyc.gov. And uh, one of the bills we actually have is to actually have public analytics on our website so that people can see how many people are using a resource that we're investing uh, money into. But I, I will say for I and on behalf of the, the Fourth Estate and members of the press who I know uh, read the MMR and comment on it, uh, this is an incredibly useful tool. I want to thank you for your work. Again, I disagree with Councilmember Greenfield on that. And uh, I think the interactive is a great step. I think the CPR is a great tool and has a great resources there. And again, the closer we get to real time, the better. Uh, I want to thank you for your partnership. I want to thank you for adding an additional schedule. I want to thank you for adding units of appropriation and working with us uh, in advance. And thank you in advance for sitting down with us in OMB until we can get to performance budgeting. And uh, ultimately, uh, thank you. Uh, I now ad adjourn this uh, hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. And uh, thank you. Thank you.